قل هذه سبيلي أدعو إلى الله على بصيرة أنا ومن اتبعني وسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وبعد I welcome you back to the second class or second series of lectures that are being held in this series in which we are studying the biographies of some of the most eminent scholars of hadith from the book Taqdimatul Ma'rifa bi kitab al jarwa ta'adil lil imam of the imam al hafir Ibn Abi Hatim al Razi Rahimahullah, who passed away in the year 327 after the Hijrah. In our previous class, previous Saturday, we started with the biography of the great Imam of the first center for Hadith studies, which was Medina, the Imam Malik ibn Anas, Rahimahullah from the Imams of the Atba wa Tabi'een, Imam Ahlul Medina, Imam of the people of Medina. Then we moved on to the second center of Hadith, Sciences and Studies in that time, which was Mecca, and studied the biography of the Imam of that region of Mecca and his people, Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna, rahimahullah, also from the Atba'u Tabi'een. Now, today, Imam Ibn Abi Hatim al-Razi, rahimahullah, he moves us in this book, Taqdidimatul Ma'rifa, from the area of Al-Hijaz, which contains the Haramain, Medina and Mecca. We move now to another area which was flourishing with Hadith and his sciences and his studies at that time, the area of Al-Iraq, area of Iraq. And in the area of Iraq, we will focus on two cities that were major centers for Hadith studies and sciences at, the, at that time. First, we will start with the city of Al-Kufa. Al-Kufa, and we will study the biography of its Imam in those times, Imam Sufyan al-Thawri. Sufyan al-Thawri. Then we will move on to the other major center of hadith and his studies in those times, which is Al-Basra in Iraq, the city of Basra. And we will, inshallah, shed light on the biography of the great Imam of Basra, Imam Shu'ba ibn al-Hajjaj. Shu'ba ibn al-Hajjaj. For these are the two biographies that we'll cover today, inshallah. So we'll start with the biography of Sufyan al-Thawri, Al-Imam Sufyan al-Thawri, rahimahullah, just as Imam Ibn, Ibn, Ibn Abi Hatim has mentioned in his book, Taqdimatul Ma'rifa, after mentioning the biography of Imam Malik and Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna. We will start off by mentioning the name and lineage of this great Imam Sufyan al-Thawri. He was Abu Abdullah. His kunya is Abu Abdullah. Sufyan ibn Sa'id ibn Masruq. His name is Sufyan, his father's name is Sa'id, and his grandfather's name is Masruq. Sufyan ibn Sa'id ibn Masruq. Al-Thawri. Al-Thawri. And Al-Thawri, this is an ascription to one of his great, great grandfathers, whose name was Thawr. His great, great grandfathers, his name was Thawr. He was Thawr ibn Abdi Manat. Ibn Ud, Ibn Tabikha, Ibn Ilyas, Ibn Mudar, Ibn Nizar, Ibn Ma'ad, Ibn Adnan. This was his great great grandfather. And this grandfather, Thawr Ibn Abdi Manat, he meets with the lineage of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Ilyas Ibn Mudar. As we all know, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He is from the great-grandchildren of Ma'ad ibn Adnan. 
of Ma'ad ibn Adnan. So Imam Sufyan al thawris lineage, it meets with the lineage of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in Ilyas ibn Mudar. Ilyas ibn Mudar. Imam Sufyan al thawri he is Shaykh al Islam. Those who have been described with this great ascription of being from the Shaykh al Islam. Imam al Huffaz, the Imam of the great memorizers and precise preservers of the hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Sayyid al-Ulama al-Amilin fi zamani the leader and the foremost of the scholars who acted upon their knowledge in their time period as Imam al-Zahabi has described him in his great book Seer Alam al-Nubula as far as his birth then he was born in the year 97 after the Hijrah he was born in the year 97 after the Hijrah in the city of Kufa, as we just mentioned. He was born in the city of Kufa in Iraq. And he was raised in a religious Islamic household filled with knowledge. For really, his father, Saeed ibn Masruq, he was from the great Muhaddithin of Kufa and from the Siqat narrators from the Hadith Siqat narrators of Hadith who narrated Hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from the most trustworthy and reliable of narrators and he was from the students his father was from the students of the great Tabi'een such as Al-Sha'bi and Khaythama ibn Abdul Rahman so his father is counted to be from amongst the Small, smaller Tabi'een, the younger of the Tabi'een, Imam Sufyan al thawri himself, he is from the major Atbaw Tabi'een. Imam Sufyan al thawri he is from the major Atbaw Tabi'een. We mentioned in our previous class that Imam Malik, the Imam of Medina, and Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna, the Imam of Makkah, they are also from the Atbaw Tabi'een. But as we will see, inshallah, when we com commence this biography, that they are considered from the younger of the Atbaw Tabi'een because they were born and died a few decades later than Sufyan al thawri Rahimahullah. Sufyan al thawri died before Imam Malik and Sufyan ibn Uyayna by 10 or 20 years approximately. So he is considered from the major Atbaw Tabi'een. So he was raised in this great household where his father was from a scholar of hadith from the precise memorizers and reliable narrators of hadith who directed him to this path of knowledge and guided him and uh, was a reason for him for seeking this path also his mother the mother of Imam Sufyan al thawri rahimahullah she was also a pious woman and she motivated her son to seek this path of seeking knowledge and to seek the knowledge of hadith by saying, Ya Bunaya, utlub al ilm, wana akfika bi maghzali. That she, when Sufyan al Thawri, rahimahullah, he reached the age where he was able to seek knowledge, he, she ordered him and directed him to seek the knowledge of hadith and of Islam. And she said, I will take responsibility of your financial affairs while you seek knowledge. I will spend upon you by my, she used to sew clothes for the woman of that area. So she said that I will support you with the income that I make by way of this uh, profession. So such was the righteous household that Imam Sufyan al-Thawri rahimahullah was raised in that allowed him to embark on this path of seeking knowledge and becoming from the great Imams from the Imams of the Muslims as we will mention and in this is a lesson for all of us for how we should also raise and cultivate upon up our children upon the love and motivation motivate them to seek knowledge especially the knowledge of the hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to the point that Imam Sufyan al thawri he himself benefited from this righteous upbringing later on in his life and he used to advise the people 
with the same upbringing that he went through in his youth by saying yanbaghi lir rajuli an yukriha waladahu ala talab al hadith fa innahu masulun anhu that really it is befitting that a person a parent he directs his child to seek the knowledge of hadith for verily he is responsible regarding him and he'll be asked regarding this responsibility by Allah Azza wa Jal. This was the first reason that allowed Imam Sufyan al-Thawri to embark on this path of knowledge and to reach this high level in the science, the science of hadith and in the sciences of Islam in generality. The second reason was the reason that we mentioned at the beginning of our lecture that Kufa was one of the major centers of hadith sciences at that time. Several muhaddithin, scholars of hadith, they resided in the area of Kufa, even though sadly, today it is known as a center for the people of innovation and misguidance. But at that time, Kufa was still considered one of the centers of hadith studies in which several of the great scholars of hadith resided. So this also allowed Imam Sufyan al-Thawri to embark on this path and to benefit from the scholars in that area. The third reason is his personal exertion and efforts that he undertook in order to attain this knowledge and reach this high level. And the blessing of Allah Azza wa Jal upon him by way of granting him exemplary memorization capabilities and a high degree of intellect and understanding. And this was well known from him, from his youth the great scholars of hadith from the tabi'een, from who, his teachers who saw him and taught him, they witnessed these signs upon him from a young age. From that is what Abu al-Musanna, he says, سَمِعْتُ النَّاسَ بِمَرُوا يَقُولُونَ قَدْ جَاءَ السَّوْرِ فَخَرَجَتْ أَنظُرْ إِلَيْ فَإِذَا هُوَ غُلَامٌ قَدْ بَقَلَ وَجْهُ That Imam Sufyan al-Thawri traveled to the area of Maro to the area of Maro in Khurasan. So the people, they came out of their residences and their places of dwelling to see this great Imam who has come to them, Imam Sufyan al thawri So Imam Abu al-Musanna, he says that I also went out to look at this great Imam. So I saw that he was a young, young man whose beard had just come out whose hair, the hair of his beard, had just come out. This shows the great status that this great Imam reached at a very young age. From that is this great statement of Imam Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi from his foremost students, from the students of Sufyan al-Thawri. He says, Ra'a Abu Ishaq al-Sabi'i Sufyan al-Thawri muqbilan faqala wa atainahu al-hukma sabiyya. That Imam Abu Ishaq al-Sabi'i, who is one of the great Imams of the Tabi'een, around whom the asani, the chains of narration of a hadith revolve. In several ahadith, you will find the na name of this great Imam, Abu Ishaq as sabii And he was from the foremost teachers of Sufyan al thawri as we'll mention soon. So when he would see Sufyan al thawri his student come to him to enter and attend his gathering of hadith, he would recite this ayah, wa atainahu al-hukma sabiyya. That Allah Ta'ala revealed for Isa alayhi salam. That Allah Ta'ala had granted him wisdom and knowledge when he was a young child. Sabi, when he was a young child. So he would do you this ayah for Sufyan al thawri rahimahullah. That Allah Ta'ala has granted him this knowledge and understanding at a young age. He reached the highest level of memor memorization and capability in precision of safeguarding knowledge, especially the hadith of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu to the point that he used to say, Inni la amurru biha bil haik fa asuddu uzuni makhafatan ahfada ma yaqul. He used to say that really I used to walk in the streets where buying and selling, the marketplace where buying and selling used to occur or where I used to find haik those people who used to sew and sell uh, clothes. So I used to close my ears. I used to block my ears out of fear that I would memorize their 
speech. Such was the level of precision and memory that he reached that he would hear something and he would memorize it just by hearing it. So he used to close his ears so as not to fill his memory with speech that is of no benefit. He also used to say, Mastawda'atu qalbi shay'an fakhanani That I have not put anything to memory in my heart except that I was not able to recall it. I never put anything in memory in my heart except that I was always able to recall it. It never deceived me. It never fled me. It was always with me. Such was the level of memorization that he reached. To the point his great student, Imam Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, rahimahullah, he says, Kuntu aq'adu ila Sufyan al-Sawri fa yuhaddith fa aqulu ma baqiya min ilmihi shay'un illa wa qad sam'ituhu. ثم أقعد عنده مجلسا آخر فيحدث فأقول ما سمعت من علمه شيئا. Such was the high level of memory that he reached and the quantity and amount of ahadith of Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم that he had memorized. This great Imam Abdullah bin Mubarak he said that I used to attend the gatherings of Sufyan al Thawri رحمه الله where he would narrate ahadith. So I would attend the gathering and by the time I leave this gathering from the quantity of a hadith that he would narrate to us in that gathering I would say that he has no knowledge left that I, has, I have not heard. He has narrated to us every single hadith that he has memorized and that he knows. Then I would come and attend another gathering and I would hear him narrate a hadith that I never heard in the previous gathering, so I will say that verily I have not heard from his knowledge anything yet. From the great quantity of a hadith and precision and memory that he reached. As far as him seeking knowledge, we mentioned that he was guided and directed by his two great parents to seek this knowledge from a young age and he traveled, undertook great vast journeys and travels for the seeking of hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and was he like us today that one of us attends uh, a course for a few days or a few weeks or a few months or even for a few years and then says that I have reached the pinnacle of this knowledge and I have now uh, reached a level that I do not need to learn and continue to seek knowledge. Let's see what this great Imam from the Imams of the Muslims, Rahimullah, he said, he says, لا نزال نتعلم العلم ما وجدنا من يعلمنا ما وجدنا من يعلمنا that we will not cease to seek the knowledge of Islam as long as we find those who are willing to teach us. As long as find, we find those who are willing to teach us. Teach us until when? Until, until death. He says, Ana fi hadha al hadithi munzu sittina sana. Imam Sufyan al Thawri rahimullah he says that I have been seeking this knowledge of hadith for a period of how many days? Or how many weeks? Or how many months? Or a few years? No, he says, I've been seeking this knowledge, this knowledge of hadith for a period of 60 years. For a period of 60 years, which is a lifetime for many of us, if we reach that time period of 60 years. From the great examples of this is what Farqad, he says that Farqad, he says, that some of the students of hadith, the scholars of hadith, they enter upon Sufyan al while he was reclining on his deathbed, a few moments before his death, while he was in his disease and sickness that, that caused his death. So one of those students and scholars who entered upon him, he mentioned or narrated a hadith in, in that gathering, while he's reclining on his deathbed, in that state of sickness, so Imam Sufyan al thawri rahimahullah, he had heard a hadith that he never heard. He heard a hadith that he had never heard. So he immediately reached 
under his bed where he was reclining and took out some pieces of paper, some scrolls in which he wrote that hadith. This is on his deathbed, as we'll see when he was 80 plus years of age. فَقَالُوا لَهُ عَلَى هَذِهِ الْحَالِ مِنْكَ يعني They became amazed and they said even in this state and at this period of time, at this age, you are still seeking the knowledge of hadith, you are still writing hadith. So he said, إِنَّهُ حَسَنٌ إِنْ بَقِيتُ فَقَدْ سَمِعْتُ حَسَنًا وَإِنْ مُتُّ فَقَدْ كَتَبْتُ حَسَنًا That verily, the hadith of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is virtue, is nobility, is goodness. If Allah Ta'ala cures me from this illness and sickness and I stay alive, then I have heard goodness and virtue. And if I were to die, then I would have written and preserved virtue and goodness. So such was the zeal of these great Imams to seek knowledge uh, until their deathbeds. From the great shuyukh and teachers of this great Imam in his vast travels and in his great efforts of seeking knowledge is that he met a great number of the scholars of the Tabi'een Rahimahumullah. Imam al-Zahabi Rahimahullah he mentions that he heard from more than 600 teachers and shiyukh from the great scholars of this nation from the great muhaddisin and the foremost of these teachers the most highest level of these teachers they heard a hadith and they narrated to him a hadith on Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu and Jarir ibn Abdullah and ibn Abbas radiallahu anhum meaning that he heard from the highest level of the tabi'een who heard a hadith from Abu Huraira, Jarir ibn Abdullah, Abdullah ibn Abu Abbas and such great Sahaba radiallahu anhum. From his major teachers of Sufyan al-Thawri is Habib ibn Abi Thabit and Salama ibn Kuhail and Ziyad ibn Ilaqa and Amr ibn Murra and Muhammad ibn Munkadir and other great scholars from the Tabi'een, other great scholars from the major Tabi'een. As far as his students, then the students of hadith they traveled far from far and wide to come to him, to hear hadith from him, to attend his gatherings. So he, his students reached a number that cannot be enumerated. The students of this great Imam Sufyan al-Thawri are such great in numbers that they cannot be enumerated. From them are some of his teachers, as we mentioned, for Imam Malik and Sufyan ibn Uyayna, that that which gives proofs to the great stature and the high level they reached in Islam and in the science of hadith is that some of their teachers themselves heard and learned a hadith from them and narrated it by way of their student. So same with Sufyan al thawri some of his teachers and those who passed before him, they heard hadith from him and narrated it from him, such as the great Imam Al-Amash, the great Imam of Kufa, Suleiman ibn Mihran Al-Amash around whom also the chains of narrations of a hadith revolve around. You'll find the name Al-Amash in, in countless asanid and chains of narrations of a hadith. From them is Imam Al-Awza'i and Mis'ar ibn Kidam and Shu'ba ibn Al-Hajjaj who we will cover inshallah in a second uh, session in this, in this lecture. The great Imam of Basra. All of them heard hadith from this great Imam Sufyan al thawri After them, Imam Malik Zuhair ibn Muawiyah and others from his, his com contemporaries, his contemporaries. Al-Mubarak ibn Sa'id rahimullah, he says that Ra'aytu Asim bin Abi Najud, Asim ibn Bahdala, wa kana shaykhan jaliyan yaji ila Sufyan al-Thawri yastafti wa yaqul ya Sufyan ataytana saghiran wa ataynaka kabiran. That this great Imam Asim ibn Abi Najud, Asim ibn Bahdala, Asim ibn Bahdala. Anyone knows who this narrator is? He is from Asim ibn Bahdala, and he is also known by the kunya of his father, Asim bin Abi Najud. He is, in addition to being the narrator of hadith and from the scholars of hadith, he is from the foremost imams of the Qira'ah of the Quran. He is his recitation and uh, mode of recitation is the one that 
we recite the Quran in today or a large part of the Muslim Ummah today recites the, uh, the recitation by way of this great Imam, Riwayat Hafs ibn Asim. Riwayat Hafs ibn Asim. We recite the Quran or a great large chunk of the Muslim nation recites the Quran by way of this mode of recitation of Hafs on the authority of Asim. Who is Asim? He is this. Asim ibn Abi Najud, Asim ibn Bahdala. He says, Mubarak ibn Sa'id, he says that Asim ibn Bahdala, when he had reached the pinnacle of, of knowledge and he was a sheikh, a great scholar who was a leader in his fields, he used to come to Sufyan al-Thawri and ask him questions regarding matters of the religion, ask him fatawa, ask him questions regarding matters of the religion. And he used to say, oh Sufyan, Verily, you came to us when you were little, when you were young. Asim ibn Bahdal is from one of the teachers and shuyukh of Sufyan al-Thawri rahimahullah. He says, you came to us to seek knowledge when you were young and now when you have reached this high level, we have come to you to seek knowledge from you when you're old. When you're old, giving proof to the fact that some of the teachers, the great teachers and, and shuyukh of Sufyan al-Thawri also narrated a hadith, heard a hadith, and then narrated it from their students, Sufyan al-Thawri. And from his other students, from those who came uh, in the generation after him, from the Tabi al are uh, the great Imams, Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi, and Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, and Abu Ishaq al-Fazari, and Sufyan ibn Uyayna, and other than them, and other than them. Then we move on to some of the statements of the great scholars of this nation in praise of Imam Sufyan al thawri and in, and in mentioning his great status in this science, the science of Hadith. Imam Shu'ba ibn al-Hajjaj and Sufyan ibn Uyayna and Abu Asim and Yahya ibn Ma'in and other than them from the great scholars of Hadith, they have all united in saying Sufyan al thawri Amir al muminin fil Hadith. Sufyan al thawri is from the leaders of the believers in hadith. And this is a ascription that very few scholars of hadith have been described with. Amir al-Mu'mineen fil hadith. Imam Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, rahimullah, from the foremost students of Sufyan al-Thawri, he says, Katabtu an alf wa mi al-shaykh ma katabtu an afdal min Sufyan. That I have rarely written hadith and knowledge from 14 or 100,000 shiyukh or 1,100 shiyukh from 1,100 shiyukh I have not written hadith from someone higher in knowledge in the science than Sufyan al-Thawri than Sufyan al-Thawri and Shu'ba, his contemporary whose biography will cover inshallah in the second part of this lecture the Imam of Basra, he used to say Sufyan ahfadu minni that Sufyan al-Thawri, really he is more more, he has memorized more than me. He has memorized more than me. And this was from the piety that these great scholars uh, acted upon in their knowledge that they used to give preference and precedence to their contemporaries and other scholars. He said that he is more, uh, he has memorized more than me. And Abdul Aziz, he says that Kala Rajulun li Shu'ba Khala Faka Sufyan Fakala Damaktani. The Shu'ba ibn al Hajjaj, the great scholar of hadith, as we will learn soon, inshallah, he was narrating a hadith. So, one of the people in that gathering, he said, Verily, Sufyan al Thawri has opposed you in this narration. The chain of narration that you have narrated this hadith by, Sufyan al Thawri has opposed you. So, he said, Damaktani. Damaktani. Yani. You have, you have uh, caused me concern and you have hurt me to a point that it has hurt and caused damage to my brain. Meaning that Sufyan al-Thawri has opposed me, so this has caused me great deal of concern that I am incorrect in this narration. Sufyan al-Thawri, rahimahullah, reached the highest pinnacle in, in, in Islam and in the sciences of Islam, the great Imam, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, 
he says, Rahimahullah, Atadri manil imam, al imam Sufyan al Thawri, la yataqaddamuhu ahadun fi qalbi. Imam Ahmad, he says, he asks his students and his companions, Do you know who is an imam? He says, The imam is Sufyan al Thawri. No one it takes precedence over him in my heart. No one takes precedence over him in, in my heart. And Imam Ahmad in this position of his followed the position of his teacher and the great Sheikh Sufyan ibn Uyayna rahimahullah who used to say that Lan tara bi aynayka mithal Sufyan al thawri hatta tamut he used to say to his students, from them Imam Ahmad, that you will rarely not see anyone like Sufyan al thawri in his knowledge and in his piety and other affairs. You will not see anyone like him until you die. Until you die in our era, you will not see anyone similar to him. Bishar al-Hafi, he says, كان الثوري عندنا Imam al-Nas. That Imam Sufyan al thawri in our era, he was the Imam of all of the Muslims. He was the Imam of all of the Muslims. And how did Imam Sufyan al thawri how did he reach this great status and this position near these great Imams? Imam Shu'ba ibn al-Hajjaj answers this question by saying, Sada Sufyan al-Nasa bil wara wal ilm. That really Sufyan al thawri he reached this position. And he took precedence over all the people in his era by way of two things. By way of two things. By way of piety and fear of Allah. As we will see inshallah in our coming points. The piety and fear of Allah Ta'ala that this great Imam possessed. And by way of knowledge. By way of knowledge. So it is not enough that a person has knowledge and he does not act upon that knowledge. These great Imams. They reached these great levels by way of striving to gain knowledge and then acting upon that knowledge. And then acting upon that knowledge. Then we move on to our next uh, point, which is mentioning some of the life events and some of the uh, positions and occurrences that happened with this Imam, which we can reflect upon and ponder. Mut al Balkhi, he says that Ahdaytu li Sufyan al Thawri thawban faraddahu alayya. Qultu lahu ya Aba Abdullah, lastu ana mimman yasma'u al Hadith hatta taruddahu alayya. That he says that I gifted Sufyan al Thawri a thob, a piece, piece of clothing. I gifted him a thob, so he returned it to me. He did not accept this gift and he returned it to me. So I said, Oh Abu Abdullah. O Sufya, Imam Sufyan al thawri Rahimullah, I am not from those people who attend your gathering to hear your ahadith. The ahadith that you convey and teach and narrate. I am not one of the students of hadith who attend your gatherings of hadith. So that you return this thawb upon me. So he says, Alimtu annaka laysa mimman yasma'u al-hadith, walakin akhuka yasma'u minni al-hadith. فَأَخَافُ أَنْ يَلِينَ قَلْبِ لِأَخِيكَ أَكْثَرْ مِمَّا يَلِينُ لِغَيْرِهِ So he said that I know that you are not from the students who attend my gatherings of hadith, but your brother, your blood brother, he attends my gathering and he learns hadith from me and he hears hadith from me. So I fear that by way of me accepting this gift from you, my heart will become more lenient towards your brother. My heart will become more lenient towards your brother more than the other students that are present in that gathering. In that gathering. So such was their piety and safeguarding of the religion in ensuring that nothing would enter their hearts that would cause them to diminish the responsibility of conveying this knowledge with ikhlas, with sincerity to Allah Azza wa Jal. Qabisa, he says, ma jalastu ma Sufyan majlisan illa zakartu al-mawta wa ma ra'aytu ahadan kana akthara zikran lil-maut minhu. That 
He says, I didn't attend. Qabisa, one of the students of Sufyan al-Thawri, rahimahullah, he says, I did not attend the gathering of Sufyan al-Thawri, except that he made me remember death. Except that he made me remember death. And I did not see or attend any shiyukh and any of my teachers' gatherings who was more reminding of death than Sufyan al-Thawri. Then, then Sufyan al-Thawri. Ali ibn Fudail, he says, رَأَيْتُ سُفْيَانَ الثَّوْرِ سَاجِدًا حَوْلَ الْبَيْتِ فَطُفْتُ سَبْعَةَ أَشْوَاتٍ قَبْلَ أَنْ يَرْفَعْ رَاسَهُ He says that I saw Sufyan al-Thawri in a state of sajda, prostration, while I started my tawaf around the Kaaba, around the Kaaba in Masjid al-Haram in Mecca. And I completed the tawaf, the seven circles, around the Kaaba and I still found Sufyan al-Thawri in the state of prostration, in the state of sajda, prolonging his sujood uh, in his prayers. Marwan ibn Mu'awiyah, he says, Shahid to Sufyan al-Thawri, وَسَأَلُوهُ عَنْ مَسْأَلَةٍ فِي الطَّلَاقِ فَسَكَتَ وَقَالَ إِنَّمَا هِيَ الْفُرُوجِ That, he says, I witnessed some of the people some of the students asking Sufyan al thawri regarding an issue that concerned divorce, that concerned matters of divorce. So this great Imam who had reached the pinnacle in the knowledge of the sciences of Hadith, he remained silent. He did not answer and he said, verily speaking about matters of divorce, matters of the private part are an extremely difficult matter. He remained silent and he did not answer the questioner. Ibn Asbat he says, سُعِلَ الثَّوْرِ وَهُوَ يَشْتَرِي عَنْ مَسْأَلَ فَقَالَ لِسَّائِلْ دَعْنِي فَإِنَّ قَلْبِ عِنْدَ دِرْهَمِ Ibn Asbat he says that some of the students, some of the people, they asked Sufyan al-Thawri and he was purchasing something in the marketplace. He was buying, selling, purchasing something. So they asked him regarding a matter of the religion. So he told them to leave him to not ask him because his concentration was on, on buying whatever he was buying and purchasing at that time for his heart was attached with that matter at that time. From this we learn how these scholars took the utmost of precaution and did not rush even though the great knowledge that they had they possessed and the great level that they reached in knowledge that they did not rush towards answering people and speaking in the matters of the religion, especially in times where they were distracted or they were busy with other matters. Today we see the smallest of the students of knowledge speaking about grave matters relating to Muslims and the Islamic Ummah while he's driving, while he's eating, while he's reclining on his bed as if it is the easiest of pastimes. So this was the great utmost precaution that these great Imams took in these matters. Then we move on to the next topic, which is the aqidah, the creed, the etiqad, the creed and belief system of this great Imam and his position in matters of creed and in matters of differentiating this creed from the creed of the people of innovation and misguidance. And we will reiterate this point as we mentioned in our previous lecture for Imam Malik and Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna rahimahumullah that these great scholars of the Salaf, they are all united in these matters of creed. They are all upon this creed of Ahlul Hadith, of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, upon the Salafi creed. And they are all united in these matters. There's no difference amongst them in these matters. For example, in the matter of Iman, Imam Abdul Razak al Sanani, he says, Sameetu Malikan wal Awza'i wa Ibn Juraj wa Thawri wa Ma'amaran yaqulun al Imanu qawlun wa Amal yazidu wa yanqus. And we mentioned the statement in the biography of Imam Malik also to show that all of these great Imams from the Imams of the Salaf were unified in these matters. He says that I heard my teachers from the great Imams of the Muslims, such as Imam Malik and Awza'i and Ibn Juraj and Sufyan al Thawri and Ma'amar Ibn Rashid and other than them, they all were unified in saying that Iman is speech and action. 
and it increases and it decreases, whereby opposing the misguided sects that arise in those times and still exist amongst us from the Murjia and the Khawarij. Abu Bakr ibn Ayyash, he says, كان Sufyan ينكر على من يقول العبادات ليست من الإيمان The Sufyan authority, he used to refute those who used to say that the acts of worship, actions are not part of Iman, are not part of Iman because the Murjia, they say that actions are not part of Iman. So he used to refute this deviated group and those people who claim, make this false claim. From his creed in the chapter or in the aspect of al-asma wa sifat, the names and attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal. An example of that is Ma'dan, he says, سَأَلْتُ الثَّوْرِ أَنْ قَوْلِهِ تَعَالَى وَهُوَ مَعَكُمْ أَيْنَمَا كُنْتُمْ That I asked Sufyan al-Thawri regarding this statement of Allah Azza wa Jal in the Quran, that Allah Ta'ala is with you wherever you are. Allah Ta'ala is with you wherever you are. So he asked him regarding this statement, so he said, قَالَ الثَّوْرِ عِلْمُهُ That Allah's knowledge is with you wherever you are. So this was the creed of these great Imams, that Allah Ta'ala, He is Mustawi upon His Arsh, above the seven heavens. And He is with us by way of His knowledge and by way of His aid for the believers. Sufyan, Abu Bakr ibn Ayyash. So, this, in this is a refutation of all those misguided people and misguided groups and sects who claim that Allah Ta'ala is everywhere. Allah Ta'ala, wa Ta'ala, a'udhu billah, is everywhere. But the creed of Ahlul Hadith, of Ahlul Sunnah, of these great Imams of the Salaf, is that Allah Ta'ala, wa Ta'ala is separate from His creation. He is above the seven heavens, Mustawi on His Arsh. He was asked regarding the Ahadith that have come with the attributes, sifat of Allah Azza wa Jal. So he said, Amiruha kama jaat. That move them along, pass them along, believe in them in the, according to their apparent meanings. Believe in them according to their apparent meanings. Not making ta'wil of them. We find today a large portion of the Muslim nation, they have followed the creed of the Ash'ari, there upon the Ash'ari creed that makes ta'wil, distortion of the attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal. But here we find these great Imams, as we mentioned for Imam Malik and Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna, and now for Imam al thawri they were, they were all united on this matter of creed that the attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal in the Quran and the Sunnah, they are to be accepted upon their apparent meanings without making ta'wil of them and distorting them. From the matters of creed that all these Imams are united in and Imam Sufyan al-Thawri is matters related to the Sahaba, the companions of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Imam Sufyan al-Thawri, he says, Man qaddama ala Abi Bakr wa Umar ahadan faqad arza ala ithni ashara alfan min ashabi Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tufya Rasulullahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa huwa anhum radin that whoever gives precedence to someone over Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhuma, then he has rarely disparaged 12,000 from the companions of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam upon whom the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam passed away and he was pleased with them and he was pleased with them And this, of course, is a refutation of the deviant, misguided sects who, are, who arose and who are present that gave precedence to Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anhu over Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhuma, such as the Rafida, the Shia, and other than them. From his matters of belief in which he is united with all of the great Imams is matters related to at tasawwuf and the Sufiya. We mentioned in our previous class regarding Sufyan ibn Uyayna, the correct position of a zuhud That zuhud is not what the Sufis and the 
Sufiya has spread amongst the people that it is to refrain from the halal. It is to refrain from the halal, to not eat and to not drink and to not wear good clothes, to punish yourself by staying away from the halal, to not get married, to not get on modes of transportation and other deviated positions they have taken in the name of Zuhud. We mentioned that Sufyan ibn Uyayna, he mentioned in our previous class that a zuhdu fima haram Allah. That zuhud is in that which Allah Ta'ala has prohibited, has made haram. Staying away from the prohibited matter, this is the true zuhud. And then he gave the examples of the prophets and messengers that they ate, that they drank, that they rode uh, modes of transportation, that they got married, and they are from the foremost of the zuhad. They are from the foremost of the zuhad. So here we will find Sufyan Athori also refuting the Sufiya and their distorted position regarding zuhud. He says in one of his sayings that كان المال فيما مضى يكره فأما اليوم فهو ترس المؤمن that wealth and money for, for in times that have passed it was something that was disliked but today it is from the shields shield of a believer it is a shield of a believer how is it a shield? he says in another statement لَأَنْ أُخَلِّفَ عَشْرَةْ آلَافْ دِرْحَمْ أُحَاسَبُ عَلَيْهَا أَحَبُّ إِلَيَّ مِنَ نَحْتَاجَ إِلَى النَّاسِ That if I were to die leaving 10,000 dirham, which was a great amount in that time, 10,000 dirham that I would leave uh, at my death, that Allah Ta'ala would take me to account for, it is more beloved to me than me living in a state of poverty where I'm dependent upon the people and asking them, uh, for financial assistance like the Sufis do and label that as Zuhud and label that as Zuhud and he used to eat the best of foods this great Imam Rahimahullah Sufyan al showed us the true Zuhud by eating the best of food that would enable him and help him in this path of seeking knowledge that enabled him to preserve the ahadith of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and to travel these vast distances, a person who does not eat, who does not uh, feed himself, then it is no way that he can take and undertake these vast journeys in the, in, the, in the preservation of the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad وسلم. It is no way that he can worship Allah Ta'ala properly. So one of the examples is a statement of his student, Imam Abdul Razak al-San'ani, the great Imam of Yemen, who ordered the book Al-Musannaf, he says, لَمَّا قَدِمَ سُفْيَانَ عَلَيْنَا تَبَخْتُ لَهُ قَدْرَ سِكْبَاجِ That Sufyan al traveled to us to Yemen. He traveled to us to Yemen. So when he came to Yemen and entered my place of residence, I cooked for him one of the best forms of meat that was available. Sikbaj, a meat cooked with various forms of vegetables and other than them. So I cooked for him, فَأَكَلَ ثُمَّ أَتَيْتُهُ بِزَبِيبَ الطَّائِفِ فَأَكَلَ ثُمَّ قَالَ يَا عَبْدَ الرَّزَّاقِ إِعْلِفِ الْحِمَارَ وَكُدَّهِ So he ate this, this meat that I had cooked for him. Then I came to him with the best of the oils from the area of Taif, south of Mecca. So he drank and ate that too. Then he said, O oh, Abdul Razak, as a means of joking, he said that, O oh, Abdul Razak, the, the uh, himar or the donkey has become full, has become full, and he has uh, eaten and drinking, now he is full. Thumma qama yusalli hatta sabah. So he used this food and drink and this uh, provision from Allah to strengthen himself upon the worship of Allah. After he said this, he stood and he prayed the entire night, the Qiyamul Layl. He stood and prayed Qiyamul Layl. He says regarding Zuhud, لَيْسَ الزُّهْدُ بِأَكْلِ الْغَلِيظِ وَلُبْسِ الْخَشِنِ وَلَكِنَّهُ قِسْرُ الْأَمَلِ وَإِرْتِقَابَ الْمَوْتِ That Zuhud is not to eat 
the most disgusting and lowest of foods and it's not to eat the most lowest of clothes like the Sufis say rather Zuhud is not to have dreams and hopes and uh, in this world and to not uh, and to always remember death that death is around the corner to not have long dreams and hopes of uh, in this worldly life that I will do such and such after 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, 60 years rather to always remember death that death can occur at any time to prepare for that event that will come without without warning this is the true zuhud not to eat the worst of foods and to wear the worst of clothes from the great positions of this great imam in the matters of creed that all the great these great imams of the self are unified upon is that he says man asgha bi sam'ihi ila sahib bid'ah wa huwa ya'lam annahu sahib bid'ah kharaja min ismatillah wa wukila ila nafsi that whoever gives his hearing and listens to a person of innovation a misguided deviant individual and he knows that he is a person of misguidance then he has left the protection of Allah Azza wa Jal and he is left to himself and he is left to himself he says Sufyan al-Thawri man sami'a min mubtadi' lam yanfa'ahu Allah bima sami' that whoever listens to an innovator whoever listens to a deviant misguided person Allah Ta'ala will not benefit him from that which he has heard from that which he has heard and this is proof of the great positions of the Salaf that to shun the innovators and to stay far away from them and to not to take knowledge from them not to listen to them not to attend their gatherings and those people who claim that we only take the good from them and leave off the evil in this statement of Sufyan al-Thawri rahimahullah is a proof against them that whoever hears an uh, innovator Allah Ta'ala will not benefit him with what he has heard he will not benefit him even if they claim that we have only heard the good and we only take the good Sufyan al-Thawri rahimahullah he says Al-Bid'atu ahabbu ila iblis min al-ma'asiyah Al-ma'asiyatu yutabu minha wal bid'atu la yutabu minha That really innovation in the religion of Islam is more beloved to shaitan to iblis than sinning Innovation is more evil and more beloved to shaitan than sinning Why is that? He says because sinning a person sins and he does it real, knowing, realizing that he has disobeyed Allah, that he is upon a wrong path and he will or he might seek the forgiveness of Allah from it. But a person who innovates, who innovates a matter in the religion, he does it thinking that he is upon goodness and, and, and upon, upon guidance. So there is no forgiveness sought from innovation. An innovator, he does an innovation thinking that he is upon goodness and righteousness. So there is no forgiveness that is taught from innovation. The opposite of this is that the Salaf, as we mentioned, they is to shun the innovators and stay far away from them, not to listen to them, not to take knowledge from them. The opposite is that from the signs of a person being upon the Sunnah and upon the correct path is him staying in the presence of the people of the Sunnah and take, t attending their gatherings and learning from them. Imam Abu Bakr ibn Ayyash, he says, Inni la ara rajula yashabu sufyan fa ya'azamu fi aini. Verily, if I were to see a student of knowledge in the gatherings of Sufyan al he would be raised in my eyes in virtue and nobility. So this was the way of the Salaf of how to deal with the people of innovation. Imam Sufyan al this is a great st statement for us to ponder upon. He says, Istawsu bi ahli sunnati khayran fa innahum uraba. That be, give glad tidings to the people of Sunnah, the Ahlul Hadith, Ahlul Sunnah, give glad tidings to them, for verily they are huraba, they are strangers in, in, in our times. He is talking about a time of the Atba'u Tabi'een. He is talking, he made this statement during the time of the Atba'u Tabi'een that the people of Sunnah, the people of Hadith have become strangers. So what about our times? If we were to reach our times, 
or witness our times, what would he say when Ahlul Sunnah and Ahlul Hadith are like uh, a black hair on the back of a white ox? They are the most strangest of people and they are the most literalist of people. Imam Sufyan al-Thawri, he says, Al-Muradu bis-Sawad al-Azam hum man kana min ahl sunnati wal jamaa wa law wahidan. This is also in this is a great correction of a misconception. He says, the Sawad al-Azam, the Prophet ﷺ has mentioned the Sawad al-Azam, the great majority, overwhelming majority of the Muslims in, in Ahadith. He says that they are those who are from Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah upon the creed and methodology of Ahlul Hadith or Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, even if they if it was a single person. A Sawad al Azam, he is who is upon the methodology of Ahlul Hadith, Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, even if it was one person. So, this is the criteria to determine what is Sawad al Azam, not who is on the who, the numbers that are following a particular methodology as the Ash'aris today and the Hanafis they claim that they are the Suwad al-Azam because they are the majority in the world as they claim that their numbers are higher than any other groups and sects but to the great Imams the Suwad al-Azam uh, is Ahlul Sunnah, Ahlul Hadith even if it was wa, even, even if it was one person then we move on to another point which is the Methodology of this great Imam, Imam Sufyan al-Thawri, in matters of jurisprudence, in matters of worship, in matters of ahkam, the rulings of Islam, and his ittiba of the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And we mentioned this, that the great Imams, we just covered Imam Malik, Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna, they were Imams in the Sunnah, of following the Sunnah unconditionally, and giving precedence to the Sunnah over the opinions of men. We mentioned the statements of Imam Malik, even though the people who came after him, they confined themselves to his statements and positions and views and blindly followed the, him, the Malikiyah, upon, who followed the Maliki Madhab. Imam Malik himself has freed himself from these people and has directed them to follow the Hadith. And directed them to leave off his statements and positions if they oppose the hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So here we will say Sufyan al-Thawri, Imam al-Shafi'i, who is also one of the Imams whose madhab is blindly followed, Shafi'iya, he says regarding his teacher and scholar Sufyan al-Thawri, he says, مَا رَأَيْتُ بِالْكُوفَ رَجُلًا أَتْبَعَ لِلسُنَّةِ وَلَا أَوَدُّ أَنِّي فِي مِسْلَاخِهِ مِنْ سُفْيَانَ الثَّوْرِ He says that verily, I have not seen in Kufa a person more, more stern and strong in following the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam than Sufyan al-Thawri. And I did not see a person that I wish that I was following his path in this following of the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam except Sufyan al thawri that I wish that I would follow him in this path of following the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, being stern upon it. Imam al-Awza'i from the students, great students of Sufyan al thawri rahimullah, who passed away before him as we mentioned, but he's heard hadith from him, narrated from him, he says, لَوْ قِيلَ لِي اِخْتَرْ لِهَذِي الْأُمَّ رَجُلًا يَقُولُ فِيهَا بِكِتَابِ اللَّهِ وَسُنَّةِ نَبِيِّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ لَخْتَرْتُ لَهُمْ سُفْيَانَ الثَّوْرِ That if it was to, said to me to, to single out a person, to single out a person from the Islamic nation in his era, in his time, who unconditionally followed and said and ruled by the book of Allah and the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I would have selected Sufyan al-Thawri, rahimahullah. Sufyan al-Thawri, to see his unconditional following of the Sunnah and his love and his diligence and zeal, in, zeal to do so, he says, an example of this, he says, ما بلغني عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم حديث قد إلا عملت به ولو مرة that I did not hear a hadith of Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم a hadith of Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم did not reach me except that I acted upon it Allah. except that I acted upon it even if it was a single time, 
even if it was a single time. We learn from this great benefit that this knowledge, as we mentioned, is for action. This knowledge is not just for the sake of seeking knowledge to stand or sit in front of the people and have the eyes, vision of the people towards you and to gain popularity and to gain status. And other than that, this knowledge is for the sake of action as we learn, inshallah, soon from great statements of Sufyan authority. We also learn the methodology of these great Imams of the Salaf in implementing the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam unconditionally and following it. Imam Sufyan authority, he said, a hadith would reach me, I would follow it, even if it was for a single time. He did not say that I would consult with so and so or look to the opinion of such and such Imam. Rather, he said that I would follow it and implement it even if it was a single time. Sufyan al-Thawri, rahimahullah, he says, يَنْبَغِي لِلْرَجُلْ أَنْ لَا يَحُكُّ رَأْسَهُ إِلَّا بِأَثَر That it is befitting that a person, if he, if he could, then he should not even scratch his head except by way of a asar or a hadith that he has in his possession and memory. That everything that he should do, it should be to in line of following the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad wasallam. Everything he does, it should be in relation to a hadith and sunan of Prophet Muhammad wasallam. From the great examples is that it was said to him, إِلَى مَتَى تَطْلُبَ الْحَدِيثِ فَقَالَ وَأَيُّ خَيْرٍ أَنَا فِيهِ خَيْرٌ مِنَ الْحَدِيثِ فَأَسِيرُ إِلَيْهِ إِنَّ الْحَدِيثَ خَيْرُ أُلُومِ الدُّنْيَا That Sufyan al thawri he was said, until when will you seek the knowledge of hadith? Until when? When you seek hadith and the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad wasallam. So he said, and what is better? What is better than Hadith, so that I might, I, I might turn towards it. What is better? Inform me of something better than Hadith, so I might turn towards it. Inna al-Haditha khayru ulumi dunya. Verily, the Hadith of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the best of the sciences of this entire world. Is the best of the sciences of this entire world. For verily, every science, tafsir, fiqh. Uh, the ex exegesis of the Quran, the jurisprudence in matters of the religion, and other sciences, they all revolve around the hadith of Prophet Muhammad Tafsir cannot be done of the Quran except by way of the hadith of Prophet Muhammad Jurisprudence, understanding in this religion cannot be derived except by the hadith of Prophet Muhammad If the hadith has established and authentic, then one can use that to explain the book of Allah and to derive rulings from it. Imam Sufyan al-Thawri, he has this great statement. He says, Al-Isnadu silahu al-Mu'min Faman lam yakun lahu silah Fa bi ayyi shayin yuqatil That the isnad, the hadith, the chain of narration, an authentic hadith, it is a weapon of the believer. It is a weapon of the believer. So if he does not have this weapon, he does not have the isnad, he does not have knowledge of hadith, he does not have hadith and his chain in his possession, then with which weapon will he, will he fight and defend himself? Really this hadith and the isnad and the chain of narration is a shield, is a protection, and it is something that a believer uses to safeguard his religion. Imam Sufyan al thawri he says, three times, إِنَّمَا الدِّينُ بِالْآثَارِ لَيْسَ بِالْرَّيْءِ إِنَّمَا الدِّينُ بِالْآثَارِ لَيْسَ بِالْرَّيْءِ إِنَّمَا الدِّينُ بِالْآثَارِ لَيْسَ بِالْرَّيْءِ That really, religion of Islam is based upon Athar, upon Ahadith and the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad wasallam. Jurisprudence and fiqh is gained from Sunnah and Ahadith of Prophet Muhammad wasallam, not from Rai, not from personal opinions and positions and fatawa of the scholars. He repeated this three times. Why? Why would he stress this? The point is that he lived in the city of Kufa, as we mentioned. And Kufa was, at that time in his era, from the strongholds, rather the center of the Ahlul Rai, the Ahlul Rai, the Hanafiya. Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, and his school of thought was the most prevalent school of thought in Kufa. He resided in Kufa, and his major students resided in Kufa. And they had given precedence to Rai, and their methodology was to derive rulings and extract rulings 
in the ahkam of Islam, in the religious matters and the worship matters of Islam from fatawa and statements and rulings of Imam Abu Hanifa and his students. And to give precedence to that over the hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to the point that Al Fudail ibn Iyad Rahimahullah he says كان سفيان الثوري والله والله عالم كان سفيان الثوري والله عالم من أبي حنيفة. الفضيل بن عياد he says really سفيان الثوري رحمه الله was more knowledgeable than Imam Abu Hanifa than Imam Abu Hanifa. We have just mentioned the great statements of the great scholars of Islam, the foremost scholars of the Salaf, the scholars of the Tabi'een from his teachers. And the scholars of the Atbaw Tabi'in from his contemporaries and the scholars from the Tabi'ul Atbaw who came after them. The great status that he reached in the science of Hadith, in the science of Islam and being an Imam from the Imams of the Muslims. So these four Madhahib that we have amongst our possession, uh, amongst our midst today, the Madhahib of Imam Abu, Abu Hanifa, the Madhahib of Imam Malik, the Madhahib of Imam Shafi, Imam Ahmad, these are not just the four Imams of Islam. And their schools of thoughts are not just as four mazahib that existed. Rather, great imams have passed before them. Great, great imams have come along with them. And great imams have come after them. Great imams have come after them. And there were several mazahib that existed. From them was the mazahib of Imam Sufyan al But these mazahib, they died off over time. Because political factors and other reasons enabled the, these four mazahib to spread around the world. So the way of the Ahlul Sunnah, the way of Ahlul Hadith, their methodology is to respect and revere all of these Imams. Is to respect and revere all of these Imams. All of them are from our Imams. And we take their statements. We understand the Quran and the Sunnah taking aid by way of their statements. We take the Haqq, that which is in agreement to the Quran and the Sunnah from any of these Imams. We might take it from Imam Abu Hanifa. And we might take it in another position, another ma matter from Imam Malik. And in another matter, we might take it from Imam Shafi'i. And in another matter, we might take it in Imam Ahmad. And in another matter, we might take it from, example, Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna or Sufyan al and other than them. We take from the Quran and the Sunnah. And whoever from these Imams agreed with the Quran and the Sunnah, then we are with them. Then we are with them. And the other Imams who have ruled with another ruling, then we make excuses for them. And their ishtihad, their ishtihad, their exertion in exciting this ruling, they'll be rewarded for. They'll be rewarded for and their mistake will be forgiven. As the Prophet ﷺ, he informed in authentic hadith that a mushtahid, someone who rules in the matters of the religion, then he is of various categories. From it is that he makes ishtihad exertion and he reaches the throat. So he gets two rewards, the rewards of his effort and the reward of reaching the throat. And there's the mushtahid who exerts himself, but even after that, he does not reach the correct position. So he'll get the reward of his exertion and his mistake will be forgiven. His mistake will be forgiven. So in this is a proof for us of the methodology of these great imams. And as we mentioned that the scholars, they used to mention these kind of statements to show that imam, Islam does not revolve around one Imam. That if you're Hanafi, then Islam is just what Imam Abu Hanifa said and in his madhab. Or if you're Shafi'i, then Islam is what Imam Shafi'i said and whatever his positions were. He says here, Sufyan al was higher in knowledge by Allah, he swore by mean Imam Abu Hanifa. We just mentioned a few minutes ago these great statements of Imam Ahmad of Imam Ahmad, he asked his students, do you know who the Imam is? Who is the Imam of our times? He said, Al-Imam, Atadri man al-Imam, Al-Imam Sufyan al-Thawri. La yataqaddamuhu ahadun fi qalbi. Verily the Imam is Sufyan al-Thawri. No one takes precedence over him in my heart. We just, we just mentioned this statement a few minutes ago. This is one of the Imams that is blindly followed today. And those blindly, blind followers of the Hanbali Madhab, they deem Imam Ahmad as to be the only scholar and they confine themselves to his statements and his positions and, and have fanatism towards him and his madhab. He himself says 
that do you know who the Imam is? Did he say it's me? It is only me, as the blind followers say. He says, the Imam is Sufyan authority. The Imam is Sufyan authority. No one takes precedence in my heart over him. No one takes precedence in my heart over him. And today, the blind followers of this Imam, the Hanabila, if you say this statement, that Imam Sufyan authority takes precedence over Imam Ahmad, uh, it might be as if Yom al Qiyamah has been established uh, for them. Uh, from the uh, returning back to the statement that verily Fudel ibn Iyad he sweared by Allah by Allah Sufyan Thawri is more knowledgeable than Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahumallah and Imam Abu Hanifa is from the students of Sufyan Thawri Imam Abu Hanifa is from the students even though he passed away before Sufyan Thawri but he is from those people who attended his gatherings and heard hadith from him and narrated it on his authority due to the great stature that Imam Sufyan al-Thawri reached in the science. Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna rahimahullah says, Ma ra'aytu rajulan a'lamu bil halali wal haram min Sufyan that I have not seen a scholar who is more knowledgeable about halal and haram permissible and impermissible matters of fiqh and jurisprudence than Sufyan al-Thawri than Sufyan al-Thawri Sufyan ibn Uyayna Sufyan ibn Uyayna he said this regarding Sufyan al-Thawri Sufyan ibn Uyayna said this regarding Sufyan al-Thawri Imam Abbas al-Duri rahimullah he says ra'aytu Yahya ibn Ma'in la yuqaddim ala Sufyan ahadan fi zamani fi al-fiqh wal hadith wal zuhd wa kulli shay the, from the foremost students of the great Imam Yahya ibn Ma'in, whose biography we will cover in our future classes, inshallah, Abbas al Duri, he says that Imam Yahya ibn Ma'in, the Imam al Jarwa Ta'adil, of praising and criticizing the narratives of hadith, he said that Imam Yahya ibn Ma'in did not used to give precedence to anyone in his era over Sufyan al Thawri. In what matters? In just hadith, he was just a muhaddith, as the blind followers of the Mazahib claim and the people who fanatically follow this mazahib that the scholars of hadith they just had hadith they were just memorizers and narrators of hadith they had no fiqh in the religion they had no understanding in the religion the understanding is with the fuqaha the understanding is with the fuqaha Imam Yahya ibn Ma'in he says that no one takes precedence over Sufyan al Thawri in his era in hadith in fiqh in zuhud and in everything else in every matter of the religion Imam al Zahabi We'll conclude with this. Imam al Zahabi, Rahimullah, says in Sira Alam al Nubula, Qad kana Sufyan rasan fi zuhud, wa ta'addub, wal khawf, rasan fi hifz, rasan fi ma'rifat al alfaz, rasan fi al fiqh, la ya khafu fi allahi law matalaim, min aimat al deen. That Sufyan al Thawri, he was a leader, a foremost head in matters regarding zuhud and fear of Allah Azza wa Jal. He was also the foremost. A leader and head in matters related to preservation and memorization of hadith and knowing his words he was also the head and and from the foremost of scholars in matters of fiqh of jurisprudence and he did not use to fear anyone in the cause of Allah Azza wa Jal he was from the Imams of this religion he was from the Imams of this religion so uh, this shows that these great Imams all of them are our Aimma we do not blindly follow any one of them. We do not have fanatism towards any one of them, thereby diminishing the status of the other Imams. We respect all of them. We give them their due right. We follow the Quran and the Sunnah in light of their uh, in taking aid by way of their statements. Take that which is in agreement with the Quran and the Sunnah and leave off that which is in disagreement while making dua that Allah Ta'ala rewards them for their ishtihad, for their effort and forgives them their mistake. These were all great Imams of, of the Salaf and of the Muslims. And I think we should take a break here. Uh, if there's any questions, then uh, you can ask them. Um, Sheikh, you talked a little bit about the war, war matters. No. And the war about, um, I'm aware of the Sheikh Al-Bani had said before he passed away, and now when the war about the Bani, mm. can you comment a little bit about uh, the timing of his statement I mean, Allahu Alam, I personally do not know of such a statement. 
But uh, of course, I mean, with, without a doubt, anyone with a sound intellect can see that the people who follow the Quran and the Sunnah upon the understanding of the Salaf, they are extremely rare and they are strangers in our times. In all Muslim societies and in all Muslim countries, the people of innovation, the people of misguidance, they are the majority, but rather the overwhelming majority. You rarely find the Ahlul Hadith, the Ahlul Sunnah, the Salafis, except in small, extremely small, small numbers. And this uh, center that we are sitting in, this is a proof of that in comparison to the big masajid that you have in the city of the people of innovation, such as the Jamaat al Tabligh, the Diobandis, and the Ikhwan al Muslimin, the Jamaat Islami, and the Barelvi Sufis, and the Shia, the Rafida, and the other various sects and groups. So the Ahlul Sunnah, the Ahlul Hadith, the Salafis, they are the smallest of people. And as we see that the great Imams, uh, they face this in their times. And even with this, they encouraged us and motivated us to stay upon this path, no matter who opposes us, by saying that you are upon the right path and you are the safe sect and the aided group, even if you are a single person, even if you're a single person, because your relationship is with Allah Azza wa Jal. These people who oppose you, they cannot benefit or harm you in the least. They cannot benefit you or harm you in the least. So we have to remain steadfast on this path, even if you are few, and in us being few is barakah and a few of the people on the right path are more heavy in the sight of Allah Azza wa Jal than thousands of people upon misguidance. Than thousands of people upon misguidance. Well, what no. I did from Sheikh is uh, in the old days, his cassette company used to be called Hora to play. Hmm. It was on uh, I said, oh, what am I see if I have a Jazakumullah <laughs> khair. Sure. As you said, uh, it's, it is said about Sufyan Al-Tawri that he was Amirul Mu'mineen Ahil Hadith. Yeah. But it's also said that he used to do Tadilis in some of the books, right? So, how, why does like a Sifa Ravi does Tadilis and is it to teach his students or can there be some other? Uh, this is a great question, which is a detailed question. And it will uh, force us to enter this science, the science of Mustalah Al-Hadith, Usul Al-Hadith and matters related to Tadilis. And I think we should leave that when the biography of Imam Shu'ab ibn al-Hajjaj comes. We'll touch about this topic of Tadlis in his biography, so inshallah we'll answer this question uh, at that part, inshallah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, so, as we, we know that he was in Kufa, right? But uh, then, uh, even though there is this scholar of Hadith, why did Kufa become like a stronghold of Ahlul as I said, there are political reasons, there are uh, several other factors, the rulers who rule these lands, um, they force the people upon this particular madhab, and no scholar who did not follow this madhab, he could get any position in those lands, no qadi, judge, no alim scholar, no mudarris teacher, no imam, no uh, Muazzin, he would be appointed except that he would declare himself to be a follower of this madhab. And uh, we do not want to go into detail because we have already taken so much time, but Imam Sufyan al-Thawri, rahimahullah, he was tested and tri he faced trials and tribulations in his lifetime from the rulers of those times. He lived in a time of great instability in the Islamic nation. He lived in a time where the Banu Umayyah, they lost power to the Banu Abbasiyah, where the Umayyad Caliphate fall, fell to the Abbasid Caliphate. And great bloodshed and great trials and tribulations occurred in, those, in, in that era, especially in the lands of Iraq where he resided. So he was afflicted and trialed and tested. And there are various stories. I mean, these short lectures can only allow us to focus on some aspects of these great Imams' lives. Otherwise, we would need days for a single of these great Imams. So he was afflicted and trialed, and he lived in a state of hiding for most of his life. And he also passed away in a state of hiding, and as we'll mention when the topic of his death, Rahimullah, comes, that he passed away, uh, and they buried him at night, uh, hiding him, and hiding the news of his death. So 
these scholars, even though they existed in those lands, but the political factors and other reasons did not uh, give them their due right and position. And uh, the people, uh, other groups and sects, they came into power and they ruled those lands. Is that because of the issue of the Khalif al Quran? There are several other innovations that occurred in those times. Imam Ahmad, who is greater than him? Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Imam Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. In his time, the Mu'tazila, they came into power. The Abbasid Caliphate, he came after Imam Sufyan Authority. He's a student of the students of Imam Sufyan Authority. And they started to force the people upon this belief of the Mu'tazila. And he was also trialed and tested, uh, which is a well-known story. And we'll mention that, inshallah, when his biography comes. So these great Imams, they did not have shortcomings in conveying the responsibility that they had on their shoulders. They preserved the religion for us. They conveyed the religion correctly uh, to us. And this is what Allah Ta'ala had uh, made as a responsibility to, upon them. We should take a break now and we'll continue inshallah after the break. So we return back, inshallah, to the biography of this great Imam, the Imam of the region of Kufa in the era of the Atba'u Tabi'een, from the major scholars of the Salaf, from the major scholars of the Atba'u Tabi'een, Imam Sufyan Al-Thawri, Rahimahullah. We will now mention some of his great statements in which are ample lessons for us where we can benefit from these statements and reflect and ponder upon them. From these statements are those that relate to the correction of one's intention and to seek knowledge and to worship Allah Azza wa Jal solely for the sake of Him alone. Sufyan Athawri rahimullah he says, Ma amalun afdalu min al hadithi idha sahat al niya that I do not know of any action that is better than seeking the knowledge of hadith, seeking hadith of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, with the condition that it is along with a correct intention, that it is done for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal, for the hereafter. He says also that uh, on regarding hadith and the science of hadith, مَا يَعْدِلُهُ شَيْئًا لِمَنْ أَرَادَ بِهِ اللَّهُ Azza wa Jal. That nothing compares to hadith and seeking the knowledge of hadith for the one with this condition who seeks Allah Azza wa Jal and his pleasure. Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak from the foremost students of Sufyan al-Thawri, he says, قَالَ لِي سُفْيَان إِيَّاكَ وَالشُّهْرَ فَمَا أَتَيْتُ أَحَدًا إِلَّا وَقَدْ نَهَا عَنِ الشُّهْرَ That he advised his students from the foremost of them, Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, that be aware, beware of popularity. Beware of seeking popularity by way of seeking this knowledge. I did not visit anyone from my teachers, from the great scholars of the Tabi'een and Atba'u Tabi'een and other than them. I did not enter upon anybody except that he warned me from, from seeking popularity. So this is the correct methodology of seeking knowledge near these great scholars of the Salaf that it should be done for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal alone for the hereafter, not in order to gain hold of the gatherings and to sit in front of the people so that they can gather in large numbers, thereby reaching celebrity status or popularity and other reasons. Imam Sufyan al-Thawri rahimullah he says, أَقِلْ مِنْ مَعْرِفَةِ النَّاسِ تَقِلْ غَيْبَتُكُ That stay away from the people, hide your actions so that your, the, the criticism that you receive from the people also decreases. This is from the great wisdoms of this Imam that the person who mingles with people and he puts himself out to the people, then the criticizers of this person will increase many fold. Those people who will take his statements and his actions and then criticize him, they will increase. But the person who stays away and, and keeps his statements and actions hidden, then his criticism will decrease. 
He has not put him out to the people for, to make him a, a, a point of attack. A point of attack. This is the benefit of having ikhlas and sincerity for Allah and hiding your good deeds and hiding your actions. Sufyan al-Thawri rahimullah, he says, As-salamatu fi an la tuhibba an tu'araf. That safety for a person's iman is in desiring for you to not be known. Safety of a person's re religion in Islam lies in the fact that he desires that he not be known. He hides his actions and his good deeds and his statements. Then from his statements are those that give proof to what we just alluded to in the previous uh, minutes that seeking this knowledge with the sincerity of Allah Azza wa Jal is to act upon it, is to act upon it. And the person who increases in, his, in this knowledge, he increases the proof of Allah Azza wa Jal upon him. He increases the proof of Allah upon him. Sufyan Athawri rahimullah he says, وَدَدْتُ أَنَّ عِلْمِي نُسِخَ مِنْ صَدْرِي لَسْتُ أُرِيدُ أَنْ أُسَلَ غَدًا أَنْ كُلِّ حَدِيثٍ رَوَيْتُهُ إِيش أَرَدْتَّ بِهِ That I wish that the knowledge that I had gained, that it would be erased from my memory, from my heart. I do not want to be asked by Allah Azza wa Jal on the day of judgment for every hadith that I have learned and that I have gained knowledge of, then I have narrated and relayed that what did you do with it? What did you do with it? Did you put it into action or not? He says, Rahimahullah, ma akhafu ala shayin an yudkhilani an nar illa al hadith. That I do not fear anything greater than hadith that will enter me into the hellfire that will enter me into the hellfire. What does he mean by this? Is not to act upon this knowledge that he had gained, not to act upon the knowledge of the hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu that he had in his possession. And he used to say, Man yazid ilman yazid waja'an walaw lam alam kana aysar al huzn That whoever increases his knowledge increases in despair and increases in troubles and if I did not seek this knowledge it would be the least of my my uh, problems that I wish that I had not gained all this knowledge so it would be the least of my problems meaning giving proof to the fact that a person he has to act upon the knowledge that he has gained Yahya ibn Sa'id al-Qattan rahimahullah he says from the great scholars of the Salaf, from the great scholars of Hadith whose biography will cover inshallah in the coming lectures. He says, Ma ra'aytu rajulan afdala min Sufyan. Lawla al Hadith kana yusalli ma bain al Zahri wal Asr wa bain al Maghribi wal Isha. Faida sami'a mudakarat al Hadith taraka salawaja. That I did not see anyone better than Sufyan al Thawri. Anyone who I gained knowledge from, from my teachers, from my scholars, who was better than Sufyan al Thawri. If it was not for the hadith of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, for this knowledge, then you would find him praying between Zuhr and Asr and praying between Maghrib and Isha. But if he would hear revision of hadith and the students of hadith have entered and have gathered, then he would leave that the prayer between Zuhr and Asr and between Maghrib and Isha and he would come to narrate and teach them the hadith of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam in this is proof is that uh, that the best of the the most virtuous of the deeds of, after the obligatory acts is seeking knowledge is seeking knowledge the most virtuous of deeds from the voluntary deeds acts of worship after the obligatory acts of worship is seeking knowledge the imam sufyan authority he would leave the voluntary prayers between Zohar and Asr and between Maghrib and Isha if the gathering of a hadith was formed so that he could teach the people and convey this knowledge to them. Sufyan al-Thawri rahimullah he says Inni la ara al-munkar fala atakallam fa'akadu abulu daman that 
if I were to see an evil and I do not speak, I remain silent, then it would make me sick to a point that I would urinate blood. If I were to see an evil and it, I would not correct it, I would not speak, it would make me sick to the point that I would urinate blood. In this also is a lesson for us that a person who sees an evil and he's able to change that evil by way of his hand or by way of his tongue, then he should not remain silent and he should change and try to change that evil. That he should change that evil. Today we see countless evils done in positions that we are able to change those evils, such as in our households, amongst our families and amongst our wives and children, where we see an evil, where we see a wrong a deed that is opposing to the rulings of Islam, but we remain silent. But we remain silent where we have the ability in that position to change that evil, to stop that evil. So these Imams took this responsibility to such an extent that if, if they were to remain silent, then he would become sick to such an extent. Imam Sufyan Athawri also says, Man, man surra bid dunya nuziya khawful akhira min qalbi that whoever is pleased with this worldly life, this temporary worldly life, then the fear of the hereafter will be removed from his heart. The fear of the hereafter will be removed from his heart. So love of this worldly life cannot combine with fear of the hereafter. It cannot be combined with fear of the hereafter. قَالَ رَجُلٌ لِسُفْيَانْ أَوْسِنِي فَقَالَ اِعْمَلْ لِلدُّنْيَا بِقَدْرِ بَقَائِقَ فِيهَا وَلِلْآخِرَ بِقَدْرِ مَقَامِكَ فِيهَا That one of the people, he said to Sufyan al-Thawri, advise me, give me an advice. So he said, work for this worldly life, indulge yourself in the affairs of this worldly life to the extent of your stay in this worldly life. And work for the hereafter, indulge yourself in the affairs of the hereafter to the extent of your stay in the hereafter. To the extent of your stay in the hereafter. A person should work in this worldly life with the affairs of this world just to the extent of the stay, a temporary lifetime that he has in this worldly life. But his focus, he should be to work for the everlasting life of the hereafter. That should take precedence than, uh, uh, than the pleasures uh, of this worldly life. We'll conclude with the death of this great Imam, Imam Sufyan al-Thawri rahimullah, as we mentioned, that he uh, lived in a time of great trials and tribulations, especially in the region of Iraq. And he lived a large part of his life uh, changing cities and traveling from cities to cities and hiding from the authorities and the people uh, who looked to harm him in that time to a point that he reached the city of Basra and he passed away in the city of Basra and he was washed and buried at night, at night uh, uh, without letting many people know in order to hide his janazah but even with that, as is the sign of the people of the Sunnah and Ahlul Hadith, that a large number of people attended his gathering, his janazah, his janazah at night. And Abdul Rahman ibn Abdul Malik al Kufi, rahimullah, he prayed upon him his Salatul Janazah, and this was his wasiyah, this was in his will, uh, that he should pray upon him due to his righteousness. And his death occurred in the month of Sha'ban in the year 161 after the Hijrah in the year 161 after the Hijrah. Imam Hamad ibn Zaid, from the great Imams, whose biographies also we will study inshallah in the future, he, from the great Imams of Basra, he came, attended when he, the news of his death reached him, he attended and he saw Imam Sufyan al-Thawri in his coffin, in his coffin before he was buried. So he told, he said, Ya Sufyan, Lastu ughbituka al-yom bi kathrat al-hadith wa innama bi amalin salih qaddamt. That rarely, O Sufyan, that I do not have 
uh, envy or jealousy of you with the quantity of ahadith that you had memorized and nar narrated and related rather with your righteous actions and your worship of Allah that you uh, left behind that you acted upon and with this we have concluded the biography a brief extremely brief biography of this great Imam from the Imams of the Atba Tabi'in Imam Sufyan al thawri rahimahullah uh, if anyone has any questions then you can ask them I mean, I said uh, that we have left off a lot of uh, uh, events and stories that occurred in his lifetime because that will take the entire time and even more time that we do not have. But we just briefly mentioned to you that he uh, led a life of hiding for uh, the later part of his life and the rulers of those times. Uh, they were looking for him, their agents were looking for the, him and they tried to harm him. And this is the uh, reasons that he died away from Kufa in Basra and they prayed over him uh, at night uh, in hiding. So you said the, the same thing about praying in the night. Isn't it from the Sunnah to do the Janazah in the night? I mean, it is permissible, but uh, of course in the daytime, the number of people who could gather and it being apparent to the people, it is not the same as in the night time. Uh, I mean, when the scholars, they mentioned that they prayed over, uh, for, over him at night to hide his janazah because they lived in a time where uh, these uh, uh, blessings and uh, electricity and these means were not at their disposal. So in those times, uh, per, uh, uh, something that was done in night was more hidden from the people than something that was done in the daytime. This is why they mentioned that they prayed over him at night because that caused his janaza to be more hidden than it would be at daytime where people would see it and then uh, attended in great numbers. So what was the year when he died? 161. 161 after the hijrah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa وذكر فإن الذكرى تنفع المؤمنين وما خلقت الجن والإنس إلا ليعبدون